Our next speaker is Dr. Jack Rowe. Um, who's a professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at Columbia. I might say that Jack, I've known Jack for about 30 years, maybe slightly more. Um, Jack started his career here as a professor and looks like he's uh, now a professor at Columbia with a few turns during this time, um, having led Mount Sinai Medical Center for part of this time, led um, Aetna, very large insurance company during this time and led two MacArthur Foundation networks, one on successful aging, on the second one on aging societies. Jack has been really a transformative um, thinker in terms of leading our nation and the world in terms of understanding what aging means, what the determinants are, and finally what the consequences are. Um, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, IOM, it's a pleasure to introduce Jack. Here's my talk. <laughs> I promise you'll be at lunch soon. Oops, did I do something? Sooner than we thought, there we go. Uh, there was a pointer which people have been using. Did you take it? <laughs> Why do you have it? Um, okay, delighted to be here. Thanks for including me. You've heard uh, a bit about aging societies already, so I won't uh, uh, dwell very much on uh, the facts about global aging. But as we think about aging societies, uh, we have uh, several important goals for them. We would like them to be productive. That is, we would like them to be able to produce the goods and services that are going to be needed by the population. Obviously, that's a challenge as a proportion of retirees or pensioners, as you saw in some slides, gets to be so much greater than uh, those employed. We would like them to be equitable. Perhaps we'll hear some uh, about this from Michael Marmot after lunch, but you know, we want them to be fair. And we see an increasing gap between the haves and the have-nots. We would like them to be cohesive. We would like to avoid tension and rifts between generations as they fight over sparse resources. We would like them to be secure, financially secure, secure with respect to their health, etc., and as has already been mentioned, we would like them to be resilient. We would like them to be able to respond to an economic shock or a climate change shock or whatever. While in the United States, and I'll emphasize most of my comments to the United States, most of what we hear about aging society has to do with Medicare and Social Security trust fund solvency there's increasing recognition that that is only a part of the picture. If we fix the Medicare and Social Security trust funds and we don't re-engineer the core institutions of our society, we, were going, we are going to fail. By the core institutions of our society, I, I'm referring to retirement and work and leisure activities and education and the design of the built environment and transportation and so on. And those core institutions, including our healthcare system, that we currently have in this country were not designed to support a society that has the age distribution of our future society. They just will not work. We need to understand how to re-engineer them. And as we do that, we need to also understand what to do about the life course. So the life course in the United States is very simple. We have three blocks of time. The first block of time is education. This starts when you're about five and ends sometime between 16 and, in some, our cases here, 40. Um, and it, it, with the exception of the people in this room, education pretty much doesn't work for anybody. I mean, it really doesn't. People don't learn much, they don't stay with it very long, they're not fully prepared to participate in society, 
uh, and so on. So that doesn't work. Next we have work. So work is uh, pretty much all consuming in the United States. It starts when you end education uh, and it ends sometime between 55 and 65 and there's not much time in there for anything else. Then we have, le and work, by the way, doesn't work for most people either. You know, they, they don't like it, they can't wait to get out of it, they hate it, etc. And then the next is we have leisure uh, or retirement. Uh, and this uh, works for almost nobody. I mean, this is a role-less role in our society, and um, it's unproductive, and uh, people are largely not engaged. So there we are. This is fabulous. So now, what's going to happen is, this is what we've created, right? This is the master Western civilization. So what, what's going to happen over the next 30 years, we're going to add about four or five more years of active life expectancy. Now what are we going to do with that? Are we going to bolt that on to the leisure? That doesn't make very much sense. So what we need to do is we need to remember back when you were kids and you would go to the seashore and you would see these fancy kind of sand designs with different colors of sand and these different strata, you know? Well, if you think about that in our life course, we have three colors. We have kind of like a brown and a red and a green, three blocks. What we need is we need these strata going sideways. We need education to continue throughout the life course. We need work to start earlier and certainly end later. We need some time for leisure, maybe a little more green, green in there along the top so that you have some time to deal with the issues related to your family during what would be the work phase. So while we're re-engineering these core institutions, we have to also figure out what to do about the life course. Now, if I were giving a lecture about the life course and I were showing 10 slides, the simple question is if slide number one was these three blocks of color and slide number 10 was this fancy set of different color strata, the question would be what does slide number two look like? Where do you start? How do you get this process going? Very, very important question. Now, with respect to the importance of an aging society, we are pretty much in denial. The Pew Survey Center, which is very respected, recently did a global survey asking people in many, many countries, more countries than I can name, although most of the people here can apparently name all the countries, but. Uh, um, is aging an important problem for your society? A full 26% of Americans said yes. The only countries below us were Indonesia and Egypt. Japan was at 85%. We are in denial. Now, several of my colleagues and I, including Lisa Berkman, who's a distinguished scholar in this area, as you all know, have uh, been very generously supported by the MacArthur Foundation to start to think about the issues in the United States of an aging society. Uh, we initially began with a different group, but Lisa and I were both involved, thinking about the aging of individuals. What are the elements associated with successful aging? And there's been a lot of work done in the last 20, 25 years in that by many groups around the world large body of evidence has been accumulated. And it became clear to the foundation and some of us that now that more and more people are aging successfully, we are in fact having an epidemic of successful aging, that, um, which is like a good epidemic, right, we think, that the unit of analysis has to change to society. And we have to think about these core institutions. So as we began this work, and we began to try to articulate some of the policy directions that we think are appropriate, and talk with policymakers, we found that we couldn't make progress because the aging of American society is encrusted in a set of concentric, dense, leather-like myths 
There are beliefs that policymakers have, and we need to demythologize aging in America for these people before we can start making progress. And I'd like, in finishing, in the next couple minutes, to share with you a couple of these myths. Now, if indeed you feel that some of these myths are true, that does not mean you are part of the problem. It means you are an American, okay? <laughs> and I sent this list of myths to the president of the MacArthur Foundation, who is a very sophisticated guy, and he wrote back saying, oh my God, I thought they were all true. <laughs> so here we go. America's aging society will be a transient demographic phenomenon caused by the baby boom. Dr. Rowe, the baby boom is like a swallowed mouse moving through a snake. And, you know, when it gets out the other end, we will be okay. We will be back where we started. We don't have to worry about this. And this is a variant, the U.S. variant. Of, I don't have videos, but, you know, I'm from Columbia. We, our endowment is somewhat smaller than ours. <laughs> But uh, this, is a, this is a traditional, uh, you know, here, uh, this is really kind of cool, actually. Uh, this purple area is the age pyramid, which was 1900. And this is a traditional, uh, women are on the right and men are on the wrong. Uh, and, um, and then what you see right down here, 1950, is the bottom age group, zero to five. You see this little blip. And that, of course, is the first uh, portion of the baby boom cohort. And you see by uh, 2000 here that here's the baby boomers up here. Uh, and uh, they're moving up. And by 2050, the very last vestige of them is gone. And if you remove that, and this is everyone over 85, I think, on this slide, uh, this bar, uh, what you have here is a conversion to a very rectangular uh, age distribution, there has been a dramatic increase in life expectancy in addition uh, to this baby boom cohort. One interesting thing from a population dynamics point of view is uh, that this, uh, the fact that this baby boom is moving up is, uh, is resulting in our aging society experience being accelerated compared to the aging society experience of a lot of Western European countries. So we, while we can learn from some of the things that they've done right and wrong, we are going to have to change pretty quickly. And it's a little scary that we're already at this stage and only 26% of the people in America think we have a problem. Um, to be old is to have diminished capacity. This is really an important myth because one of the solutions is to get more older people in the workforce for a longer period of time, and you're not gonna establish policies to do that if you're convinced that old people can't work. And the fact is that there was, for over 20 years, a significant reduction in the age-specific disability rates, and pretty much leveled off around 2002, but here are some uh, data from the National Health Interview Survey showing the proportion of people who uh, rated themselves as only having fair or poor health, which is the bottom two of four estimates of self-reported health. And what you see here out at age 65 is that um, the, in 1982, about 35% uh, of the people were not in particularly good health by their self-report, which is pretty reliable. And by 2002, this was down to 20% which means there were like six or eight or 10 billion additional fit older people than there would have been had the disability rates not changed. Very significant change. The key age group in an aging society is the elderly. This is in fact a myth. That's right, it's a myth. And just not a trick slide, it's a myth. And, and, and and the point here is we need to think about society and the interaction of different age groups. So what happened in Western Europe? They aged ahead of us because they had a baby bust after World War II and we had a baby boom. And they had huge pressure on their entitlements and their social welfare systems for older persons. Did they cut those retirement benefits? No. 
politically they didn't do that. Did they increase taxes and revenues? No, they were pretty high. What did they do? Well, in many countries, they'd cut the education budget. So what age group was most impacted by the aging of society in those countries? Youth. So you really have to understand that you have to think about each age group separately. Intergenerational political warfare is inevitable in an aging society. This is the greedy geezers, you know, et cetera. And uh, there have been books written. Uh, one uh, colleague of mine, Pete Peterson, he's written five or six books about this. Different titles, uh, pretty much the same content. And um, the, the, the problem with this, the problem with this is that uh, there's no evidence to support it. So all the surveys show that middle-aged people support Social Security. In fact, one survey I saw, the proportion of them that supported it was higher than the proportion of the elderly that supported Social Security. And uh, so why do they support it? They support it for two reasons. Number one is they realize, most of the students in this school probably don't realize, but they realize that Social Security was developed as a financial support program for middle-aged Americans. That was its goal. And if Social Security didn't exist, they would be paying the rent for their parents, buying their parents' food, taking care of their parents' transportation, or their parents might even be living with them. The second reason is that they have paid into Social Security and they see themselves as future beneficiaries. So now is not the time to get rid of it. However, there's an implicit question in here. Because it's possible, as things get tighter and tighter, that there will be future greater tension between the generations than there is now. And I'm talking at a societal level, not intrafamilial level. And I think there's a variant of this question that may, may be a problem if we don't have a cohesive society. And that's going to be in 30 years, will middle-aged Hispanics support old whites? because we've got some racial ethnic changes in these various age cohorts of our society, and we're going to have a situation in which we may, may have a variant of this. And that's why we need a cohesive society. Policymakers must choose between investments in youth or the elderly. And the thing, one of the things that drives me crazy is that advocates for children write articles about this is the only generation worth investing in, and it's like they want to put the rest of us out on an ice floe somewhere, you know, or something. Why don't they, like, focus on the defense budget and cut that? Why, why do they have to try to pit one generation against another? And, and uh, Lisa pointed out to me some years ago uh, an outstanding study that was done um, in South Africa looking at these uh, social welfare benefits for older individuals after apartheid and many of these uh, families had worked in agriculture all their life. They hadn't built up any equity and, and uh, an economist at MIT, Esther Duflo, uh, distinguished economist, uh, observed that in the households, these are all multi-generational households, there's often no grandfather or even father, but there's a grandmother, and then in the households where the, the, the welfare checks went to the mother, the granddaughters were taller and did better in school. Uh, you know, they had more to eat, and they had more time to go to school, and they didn't have to go work in the fields. Those are transgenerational effects. You don't have to necessarily choose between one generation or another. You can try to develop policies that are win-win. Almost done? You're doing great. Just another minute or two. The principal problems of an aging society relate to Social Security and Medicare Medicaid. As you all probably know, the unfunded potential liabilities in Medicare are seven times that of Social Security. The Social Security problem can be relatively easily fixed. Social Security is a payroll tax. You pay up to a given income and then you don't pay above it. That number is currently about $113,000. If that number were $135,000, the Social Security Trust Fund would be fine. 
Everybody knows exactly what to do to fix Social Security. It's just a matter of having the political will uh, to do it. Um, but I believe firmly that if we do fix these problems and we don't re-engineer the workforce and the retirement policies and, uh, and some of the educational policies and incentives, we will, in fact, fail. The problem of an aging society in the United States can be fixed through increased immigration. Now, this is obvious, right? I mean, what we want to do, if we want to fix the aging problem, is what it, problem is we want to increase the number of young people who come in uh, to keep the ratio of old people to young people constant. So there are two problems with that. First problem is, if you want to do that, it's estimated that you have to increase immigration from its current rate by about 750 percent. It's not going to happen, right? Not going to happen. The second problem, even if you do that, is that it has recently been proven that immigrants age. <laughs> so that once they get in the population, they actually move up. So you have to keep increasing the immigration rate in order to compensate for that effect. I want to see you can do something about that. Here's one of the, this is a hardy perennial, this, this one, this really is. Um, old workers must leave the workforce to make room for younger workers. What could make more sense than this? And, you know, years ago in economic textbooks, you would see this, and it was called the lump of labor hypothesis. There is a lump of labor and it has to be done by people, and if there are old people doing some of it, then there's no room for young people. Some very, very nice work uh, in the United States by uh, David Wise, a professor here at Harvard, and Jonathan Gruber down the street, and in Europe by Axel Borst Supan of the Max Planck Institute and others, have pretty well demonstrated that this is uh, not true. And so the textbooks now call this the lump of labor fallacy not the lump of labor hypothesis. There's no clear evidence for reciprocity between employment, rate, employment rates and older workers and younger workers. It's one of these things where the strong economies uh, lift all the ships and vice versa. And uh, I'm not saying this doesn't happen in some particular instances. Um, and I, I um, as Lisa mentioned in passing, I, I had a couple jobs in my career where I had a lot of employees. I had 45, 50,000 employees in a not-for-profit institution I ran and then in a for-profit institution I ran. And so I dealt with this issue all the time. And the issue for employers is that older workers are more expensive because they have five times the health care utilization of younger workers and almost all of these large organizations are self-insured for health benefits. And, uh, and that if we could find the mechanisms to make these people, particularly the 65-year-olds, eligible for Medicare, and as Medicare would be their primary payer because they paid into Medicare, then they would be much less expensive for the employers and, and their wisdom and experience would be uh, probably something that would keep them uh, in the workforce. So what would failure look like? What if we don't make the changes we need? We would have wider gaps in opportunity, education and wellness between the haves and the have-nots. We would have a lack of capacity to meet societal demand for goods and services. And we would fail to benefit, and I've not mentioned this, but it's very important. We would fail to benefit from the potential contributions of a very large, experienced, healthy, older population. One idea going forward, an idea proposed by Lisa Burton. We're all familiar with the environmental impact survey, that every time you want to do something in our society, you have to check a box saying that you've evaluated the potential environmental impact of this. And it might be good for the environment, or bad for the environment, or neutral, but it is what it is, and you've at least done the assessment. Maybe we need an aging society impact evaluation. 
And when we look at laws, whether they're transportation laws or housing laws or agriculture laws or any other kinds of things, maybe we need to force policymakers to stop and think, is this moving us in the right direction to cope with the problems of an aging society and the challenges and to reap some of the benefits, or is it moving us in the opposite direction? Thank you very much. <laughs>